in the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 194. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Dawson Tire and Wheel, your premier ag tire and wheel provider in North America, helping people grow. Tractor Zoom, delivering insights, and dry shod boots, the official work boot of the Moving Iron Podcast. This week, I have uh, the pleasure to have Aaron Fennell back on here. We're just coming to uh, see where it goes, man. He and I have a have a pretty good record of not ever really thinking through what we're going to talk about and just see what happens and it always turns out pretty good so aaron how you been man i have been fantastic it's just a beautiful beautiful january day snow falling nice and soft it's colder than shit yeah the only problem with all of that is it's october yeah so. yeah the week before thanksgiving or thanksgiving you threw me off there <laughs> week week before uh, halloween here we've got <laughs> I, so I'm in I'm in uh, Scotts Bluff here, Gary, Nebraska, up here in the Panhandle, and we've got, oh, uh, I think we probably got s- almost seven inches of snow, and it's still coming down. It looks like they're supposed to snow through uh, through tonight and tomorrow morning. Um, good thing for that is there's still a lot of sugar beets out in the field. Most of the corn's been kind of cleaned up for the for the uh, most case, but. It, the good thing about this is it's uh it's 18 degrees tonight's low i think is like one or something like that um i guess yes last night's low was one um and then you start looking into some cool temperatures so luckily before it got too terrible cold we had a, a good blanket of snow come across the top of that to kind of insulate the ground a little bit and, and kind of keep some of those sugar beets from freezing too bad but you never know what you get till you start digging so uh what's the uh you're down in where you're at aaron for Collins, yes, cur- currently in the Foco right in now. Foco. Foco and Noco. All right, what's the uh, what's the weather uh, forecast for uh, Northeast Colorado? Uh, I'm not real sure. I think it's supposed to. I believe it's winter storm watch or warning. It mm-hmm. seems like it changes every five minutes yeah. until late today. I think. Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of what uh, what's going on with all that. It's supposed to just snow all day. It's pretty calm, but it's uncharacteristically cold for here. It's like twelve degrees right now. Yeah, usually they're never as cold as we are in the up in the handle. Right. It's uh maybe maybe you can get some of that cold air to freeze the fire. Get frozen <laughs> frozen fire in the mountains. Well, I tell you what, there's enough snow on the ground right now that it's going to help. If it's doing that in the mountains, which it should be double or triple what it's doing in town, yeah. then, yeah, that, that ought to ought to be a tremendous help to the thousands and thousands of acres on fire yeah. just, just right west of town anymore. Yeah. Keeps creeping. Keeps creeping in there, doesn't it? All right, man. Well, kind of last time we talked about what we saw happen here the last quarter of the year amongst a lot of other things. But, we, you know, as I look out there and I see um, these prices of, of the commodity prices that we're seeing, you know, I think waiting to see what happens overnight here. But, you know, Friday corn, December corn almost closed at 420. And uh, it was like 419 and a quarter. And then you had uh, March corn was like 420 and a quarter or something like that. So, there's a lot of uh, a lot of prices out there where a lot of guys. If you look at kind of in our general area, you're you're beating on that four dollar um, cash corn drum pretty hard. Anywhere from from three seventy five to four bucks, depending on where you're at. Uh, wheat market's doing the same thing. It's 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 climbing. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of good um, things happening right now with guys that are that are got some opportunities again. But you know. It kind of depends on what they afford contracted up to this point and what that looks like. So I am very optimistic, like we talked about last time, that that November and December are going to be pretty busy for us. I feel like there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to either A, look at upgrading the machine, or B, um, get some of those um, more costly repairs done to, to some machines they've got on the farm. Um, but I do feel like there's going to be a, a bit of a run here in this last quarter. Um, more 
the more I talk to folks, the more optim- optimism I hear in their voice uh, as we start kind of heading into that, that end of the year. Plus, on top of that, just like we've talked about in the past, you know, November 15th, mid, mid-November, a lot of guys are going to be done. This storm is going to set people back a little bit, but as far as the timeline goes, but for the most part, most guys are going to be done and have a good opportunity to start thinking about what they need to do going into the end of the year and what they need to do pre-plant season. You know, there's actually got a chance to catch their breath here and not not try to talk to their accountant inside the combine as they're cutting corn or picking corn, sorry, in, in, uh, in uh, you know, December 28th. You know, so right. So I think there's a, there's going to be some more th- more uh, more thought, more more uh, kind of really digesting what what's going on. And uh, I guess the conversation that you've had with people, Aaron, what what are you starting to feel out there? Yeah, I you know as a as a dealer and as a guy who only does used. The length of post harvest time that these guys will have, I actually am not looking forward to because <laughs> because they have got two months to find whatever it is and just wait, you know, and and that and quite frankly, that's if they have to do anything, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, there there's a lot of guys that you know here at harvest, which is super rare. Never at harvest do you see prices climb, 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 climb. Right. You know, yeah. The biggest factor for that, I, you know, me personally, I'm not, I'm not like your buddy Chip, but the biggest thing I see helping that is, you know, there's spots in Illinois and Indiana that were way down. Yeah, we got the made up storm name in Iowa where those guys lost everything, and I think that's all starting to show up. Yep, I know. You know, I talked to some guys in Wyoming this last week, and we all know Wyoming isn't, you know, the king of corn. But there, there's there there are elevators in Wyoming that have a plus basis on corn. Yeah, just to get it. I saw that. Okay. The other day. Yeah. Now that's one little, two little areas in Wyoming that is not, you know. Ankeny, Iowa, or you know, something right. like that. Yep. So that's that's a whole different realm. But it, I feel like if that is that way there, and they're doing a positive basis at harvest to get corn, there's got to be a little less corn out there than than NASA's reporting or you know any of that. Yeah. Otherwise, they could rail the shit in for three bucks and be like, "Oh, well, we're good." You know, yeah. Yep. So, and or they could, you know, shit, get it in the Panhandle of Nebraska that's close because there's corn piles all over. So, yep. I, you know, I I don't mess with markets. I I pay attention to what the price is. I don't try to second guess. I don't try to ever ever in my life be a, a marketing whiz. So that's just. You know, there there's got to be there's things happening in favor finally after about six solid years of down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, are we gonna have one dollar corn or? Yeah. Nope. We we hit into the upper twos and started back up. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of news. I mean, you look at the news cycle. You know, this time so was it June last year? We hit that 450 mark, and then. You know, this, whatever the whatever we were doing with China at the time didn't didn't jive, and so it fell back off. Then you had COVID hit, and that we had corn hit like three bucks on the board. Right. You know, so there were a lot of speculators were were saying, you know, if it hit three, if it two ninety nine, it was going to go to you know two fifty, and luckily it didn't do that. But you know, we've rebounded nicely. We're up, you know, dollar twenty on 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 corn right now. So I don't know. I think there's a plenty of opportunities for guys to to take a look and see what happens now. There's a million things they've got to worry about outside of of, of uh, the equipment side of their of their of their business. You know, they've got bankers to keep happy. They've got other you know lines of credit to to service and those kind of things. So there's a lot of things on their plate right now that they've got to just get you know 
get off their plate before they can start making some other decisions about you know what what's next year look like or what's my tax situa- situation look like this year and i mean really some of these mfp payments and and uh oh these i can't remember what the other covid thing was that they were they were passed what's that what's that called i can't remember what that cfap was. yeah cfap um those kind of payments help too i mean so there's there's uh there's opportunity out there for guys to ha- to actually show a positive a positive amount of money this year and, and what does that look like so i think you know, you you kind of toss those things into the bucket, and then everything else they got going on. And there's going to be some some profit, profitable farmers out there we haven't seen in the past. You know, so um, I'm looking forward to see what happens with that and how that plays out. Because, like you said, it's been it's been dismal for a lot of years, and um, you got to hit those you know hit those strides when you when they're there to hit. And I think that's we're seeing one now. And but that being said, I feel like that's going to carry on. I don't think this is a this is a big blip. I don't think I'm not saying we're going to have $8 corn again or anything like that, but I really feel like you know what the guys I have on Hunter, you know Sean Hackett and and Chip and Chip Nellinger of Blue Reef Agri Marketing and Sean Hackett of Hackett Financial, you know, and they're on here. They've talked about, you know, Sean's talked about it a lot, you know, that this is more of a a uh a phase transition to where we're going to see, you know, higher lows and higher highs just based on what the weather has in place. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about what we see happening here. So I really feel like the market's moving in a, in a direction that's going to help keep guys profitable longer. Yeah. 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 I would agree with that. In increased market volatility. Yeah. When the market's volatile, you get chances to make money. So that's where, yeah, got to pay attention. I just like I just like to use the big words. Yeah, you toss them around nicely. They flow off. I do. I well. do. Well, we're we're just transitioning into a period of increased market volatility. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to be on RFD, baby. Yeah, yeah, they're going to call you tomorrow, Mark. You're going to be on that uh, <laughs> market. What's that uh, market wrap? There, uh, market um, market market day. Market day. There you go. Yeah, market day. You'll be on there as a. You can get you can get one of those cool. Um, Sports coats like that guy that's got like the cow sport coat or the, or oh, the <laughs> yeah that guy or the lady with the fire fire yes you could Virgin- be Virginia McCaffrey that's it yes you can get get that one so yeah that'll you could really bring some spice to the uh, to the commentation there on uh, RFD absolutely you can get like a like a sheep like a wool like an actual sheep hair hair sheep like jacket and just wear it around ooh. Damn, you got all the good ideas, man. Yeah, I got a few of them. I got a few. All right, so <laughs> let's think about let's think about it as we move into uh, the first of the year. And I've been given a lot of thought to planner technology here of late, and what does that look like moving into twenty one? So we are, well, from a deer perspective, anyway, we are. Uh, what 2015 so we are this will be the seventh planning season of exact emerge technology that that's been available and um you know precision has been out there for a long time as well but seven years of really that that you know with the dip in the economy that that whole idea of high-speed planning has been something that's uh gotten to be more and more um, important and more and more uh, on the on the minds of of folks out there so when you uh when you talk to guys right now are there more guys looking at just flat trading out their combine or trading out their combine trading out their planner for a newer one or are there some guys out there that you've talked to that are thinking about doing the whole you know precision upgrade you know um retro kit deer retro kit upgrade those kind of things that seems to have kind of I don't know that fizzle's not the right word, but it's not I don't hear as much talk about it as I did maybe you know this this planning season, the planning season, two planning seasons ago. So what what's your thoughts on that? Yes. Um real quick though, <coughs> just mm-hmm. for the for our global audience, every time we do we record this podcast, Casey and I sit there and kind of shoot the shit for a couple minutes beforehand. And we always joke that we're not allowed to say combine or auction every episode. <laughs> and now, just by a slip of the tongue, you do. So, drink. So there's that. <laughs> 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 
on the planner scenario, used in the used market, yes, exact emerge is is um I don't want to say like crazy high demand, but it's definitely the preferred choice if the numbers work. Right. The the neat thing about it is back in well that I was gonna go into a big long story that I don't need to, but since Exact Emerge has come out, we have been in a down economy every second of the whole time. That has tremendously helped the used market because it's not 2012, 2013, and everybody on earth went and bought a new one and then traded it in, and they, they're they just plummeted to the bottom like 12 and 13 mm-hmm. combines. Right. So the fact that there aren't that many new ones sold, or I shouldn't say that, there's less and less, there's less new ones sold, that is has helped keep the numbers low on the market, which then keeps the demand high in the market, as everybody knows, supply and demand. So I think that's helped quite a bit. Me personally, you know, where where I'm pretty much dealing, well, I shouldn't say pretty much, I only deal out of our immediate trade area. I have never had one upgrade kit discussion because I think that is you take your planner to John Deere, you buy the kit, you pick it up and it's exact to merge. Right. You know, that's that's not something you at least me, mm-hmm. that's not something I want to get all these pallet boxes home and start spending my January and February recreating the wheel. Right. You know. So that's kind of my take on that. I think I know that the retrofit kits. I know the. I know Mother Deer is moving them. I think it's a great idea. I you know obviously there's still more guys that are wanting to just trade their planner instead of just updating it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that being said, there are guys doing the update. Yeah, at least to me, I would say it's probably. 10 to 1 on trade versus upgrade. Yeah. Maybe even a wider gap than that. But then again, it, you know, it's very farm specific too. Yeah. I, you see more guys that, man, we'd really like that exact emerge, but we have to trade. We can afford to just trade for a 5E and not an exact emerge. Okay, so they did that in 15 or 16. Those are perfect guys for an upgrade. Mm-hmm. The guy with the, the 10 to 14, 1770, very rarely do you have those guys. If, they, if they're going to spend that kind of money, they're going to trade. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I think a lot of guys were, when I look at that, there are a lot of folks that were looking at, the one thing about used planners, let's just put it this way. One thing about used planners, like you mentioned before, and the since the big sell off in in 2014, 2015, 2016, um, of all of those machines going to auction and and kind of cleansing the uh, the whole the whole kind of space, the whole planning space. Uh, there, there's not many used planners on the marketplace right there's not a bunch of laying around out there so <clears throat> at any time that you want to go out and, and try to trade into a different machine the good thing about that is with with the supply and demand being the way it is even on the use side there's opportunities for i don't I mean we looked at planners where guys bought them at auction and we gave them back what they bought it at auction for just because you know three seasons later you know what i mean so it was there there's opportunities there just because of what the market was, right? So there's plenty of Not people. Not only that, that, we've looked at, we've given guys more yep. than they paid for it at auction. Yeah. So there's been, uh, there's been just those kind of opportunities, little niche things that kind of pop up that have that have done that. Now, real quick, Casey, yeah. I know this is going to get us off topic, but this is the kind of things that that go through my mind, mm-hmm. and this is the kind of things we we discuss off air that maybe the listeners 
out there would would like to know a little glimpse inside of because you're excellent with trends and forecasting and all that kind of stuff whereas i am like oh today is today tomorrow's tomorrow you know do you we we fixed the the planner market sucked right no it's horrible it was worse yeah. than combines yeah for like a two or three year period there yep but everybody at the same time purged right it fixed that planner market in less than a year mm-hmm. less than one year did 10 to 14 24 rows turn around they right. didn't jump from 50 back up to 150 right but they turned around and been climbing ever since. Mm-hmm. Leveled off now, but we're we're five year, we're half a decade since the purge. Right. Why hasn't that happened in combines? <laughs> not enough. Not enough of the twelves and thir- the the twelve to fourteens. Not enough of them flushed all at one time. No. Well, I, I think I think the big thing there is that um, they're no one traded them you know what i mean it was like everyone just kind of got a they got their new 12 or the new 13 or the new 14 and for the most part just kind of it was just there like there was no trade differences didn't work for five years right and now oh right you know what i mean so now but what we see now is what's coming in on trade in that particular spectrum you know that spectrum of years is that pretty much it's kind of got the same number of hours on it right so that's that's the the big difference there, you know. I argue this all the time with people, and some people tell you know look at me like I got two heads when I say this, but when outside of metal fatigue or those kind of things, you know, you know cracking or those kind of things, if you have a thirty thousand acre planter that's been completely rebuilt, right, all the way through, and it's it's you know basically brand new again, and you've got a, a one or two year old machine that's got relatively the same amount of wear you know and it's and, and both of them are, re, are rebuilt back to brand new what i mean do you really have that much difference right you have if you have a 15 model um versus a 17 model right at what point yeah acres play a big part in the overall kind of feel of the uh, of of the of the marketplace but if both of them are, are, are rebuilt to the exact same level of reconditioning, at what point does that kind of offset the number of hours on it? Again, unless you have cracking and metal fatigue and those kind of things, and yes, you got to worry about that more on a on a thirty thousand acre planter. But if everything's sound and solid about it, I mean, what, where where does that start to play into that? And I think I don't know. I think that's why the planter was different. Right, because there's not a not an engine or a hydrostat or those kind of things where you got to worry about. If the engine blows up, you got to spend however many tens of thousands of dollars to put the new engine in it, or you know the, the hydrostat or the transmission or whatever you know whatever you got going on there. To me, I think that's why that why that planter market rebounded so quickly because you know I, I can rebuild a planter and for all intents and purposes it's new again. And right, you can do that on a machine, you know, but you have to rebuild all the mechanical parts of it, all the, all the, this, that, and the other thing to make it work. And it's just not feasible at that point. So I think maybe there's a lot of speculation on, on my part on the planner side, why it took off and came back so quickly comparatively to, you know, a 7,500 hour tractor or a 3000 hour combine or something like that. There's that, that hint in the back of your head that says, well, how many more hours do I got left on that, that, engine before i got to do an underhaul or an overhaul or whatever you know what i mean <clears throat> i think that might be some of that into there yeah i get that you know because on a planner as long as your bar and the hinges on the bar and all that are good you can rebuild everything behind that toolbar time and time and time again right and rebuilding the planner is not cheap but it's cheaper than pulling in a 2500 Step hour six eighty and just having at it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think By the that's time the other you side get done too. with that, you've bought a seven eighty, but you still have a thirteen six eighty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's that 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 part of it there. I mean, I think I think that's the other thing too. Why tractors always seem to 
hold their value more more steady you know what i mean even though even though we saw a dip in values across the board on used equipment whether from 20 from what the values were in 20 you know 13 2014 compared to what they went to in 2017 yeah we saw a dip across the board but you know a row crop tractor or a loader tractor or um, a four-wheel drive or something like that there was a time where each each of those had their had their day you know of um but really the the four-wheel drive tractor kind of had their dip and, and everything else was more sought after than that and then all of a sudden we had too many row crop tractors and you know all of a sudden now we've got this this problem with this and never really had that with, with loader tractors to speak of i mean there was a little lull there but for the most part loader tractors have always stayed fairly fairly consistent fairly strong um because one thing to say was you know if, if in our area anyway where when the cattle market was was down um you know hay prices were high so guys were running balers with them um or or vice versa you know what i mean so there's a uh it feels like to me there there's an opportunity for everything to kind of level itself out and we've seen that on the tractor side it's unfortunately on the combine market it's just never it's just gotten it's gotten i think it's gotten worse because know, worse isn't the right word it didn't get worse it just kind of stayed the same because of the number of machines that are coming to the marketplace that are basically the same had those combines gone through their their typical trade cycle and you would have seen um a 2012 or 13 you know kind of go through you know three or four different owners by now um we probably wouldn't have this situation that we're having in the marketplace but unfortunately you know everything came back to the market that was five years old six years old you know four five six years old and it just kind of has the same hours on it and there's just that you know i want to trade my 2000 hour combine in on something else and there's not a you know i'm just going to add to that to the pile there's not that that you know 750 hour thousand hour um combine there's not that many of them laying around out there which we saw that early in that's what we saw in those auctions that we saw so early in in the in the summer here with the machines that sold that really brought big big money at those things were machines that they're, they're not there weren't any in captivity right the 350 hour or less combines there wasn't there weren't how many of those were in captivity during that time frame not very many right and those machines sold and you know we all know how that story ended but everything else on the other side of that though i mean there was a few shockers right but for the most part the the 12 13 14 model um combines that got that sold there there wasn't a big shock there what those brought i mean that was they might have brought a little more than than what we'd typically seen but for the most part it was not holy crap the markets turned around because look at these ones that have been selling for 80 grand they still sold for 80 grand right or thereabouts right. you know exactly but everything else on the other side of that 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 was just a rarity in rare form were bringing help more than we had them listed for you know so it was just i mean it was just i just think that's the biggest thing why the combine market is just not rebound is because the way it is because it's just one of those things where so much of the same thing is getting brought to the marketplace and it's just there's just this slug of equipment right there you know like like we track that number of machines by hours right and you can look at the right. curve you can look at the curve out there and you see where it's at and you start looking at combines and and the numbers start to rise when you get up there at that um you know 1500 to 2500 hour combine there's a huge number of combines in that range on each side of that hardly any right but it's it's just well it's hardly any is probably not the right term but it there's far less far less right i mean there's so it, it's just uh and, and what we see too is is the machines that are what i've noticed anyway when i look at machine repeat a tractor house or fast line or any of those places like that and start kind of doing some analysis and paying attention to that is that we're kind of what we're seeing feed the marketplace in that 750 hour range to 500 to 750 hour range is there's a lot of one and two year old machines that fall into that mix which tells me those are a lot of higher hour you know higher use um owners you know probably like custom guys or something like that that are doing that and there's not a lot of 
one year old i'm gonna i'm gonna take my one year old combine and put 150 200 hours on it and the next guy is going to take it and put you know 100 to 150 hours on it and the next guy is going to take it you know and he's going to put 100 hours a year on it for the next three years type of thing we're not seeing that organic kind of growth up the you know as it as it should matriculate through um the trade cycle you just not we're starting to see that again that's starting to kind of creep back in to the into the story, but um, there's a, just a five year lull there where it just didn't work for a lot of people to trade, and I totally understand it. I mean, it was just the way the market was at the time and, and the number of machines out there. But um, and that's across the board. I mean, whether it's Deer, Gleaner, Case, or New Holland or whomever, Lexion, whatever, their their market segment. It reflects the same thing. It's not like there's some difference in big difference in the way values, you know, kind of change throughout the marketplace. It's just it's the exact same thing. I mean, everybody has a bunch of twelve through fourteen model whatevers, and on both sides right. of that, there's not a whole lot. So it's just now. Uh, just to be clear, you did just say matriculate. Yeah, correct? matriculate. Yeah. So that is a true Chiefs fan. To throw out some Hank Stram vocabulary during your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well a, played, sir. Well played. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think that's my that's my two cents and what I why I thought the the difference in in the marketplaces. I mean, I just feel like there's planners are, are cheaper and not cheaper is probably not the right word, but it's just you can erase it, right? You can erase time by rebuilding it you know what i mean where you can't necessarily right. erase well, time on a combine or a tractor yeah you know that's kind of like of the, of the three levels of tractor which you know to, to us is like 100 to 150 has or shit even 100 to 180 in our world it has a loader on it and right. story yep you know, yep. over 180, it's an 8,000 series, and then four-wheel drives. Right. Of those three categories that you were talking about, the only one of those that's had a true, true dip at all is the four-wheel drives. Right. Yep. It happened shortly after the planter thing, and we all know what the dip in those four-wheel drives was. Guess what, everybody? 12s and 13s. Right. Why? Because there's too damn many new ones bought. But they fixed themselves, leveled out, and slightest little bitty uptick. Yep. So well, the only well, thing not pulling their own weight is the the threshers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, but you, we'll see that again. I mean, if when when commodity prices get around, we got four dollar corn, cash corn, four twenty five cash corn, those kind of things. They, I mean, we're going to go right back to. You know, selling a lot of new equipment. We're going to go right back to selling. Um, you know, then we'll have that that breakup in between. The biggest thing during that time frame that drove it was just. I mean, everybody had a bunch of money. Everybody had cash. Everybody had. You know. Oh yeah. You know, when your sales pitch yeah. was, you know, I got an extra line on the buyer's order. What you need? What else do you want? And that, that was, you know, just had a lot of a lot of different things going on. Plus, on top of that, you know, it's had Section One Seventy Nine come out. So you had all these other things on top of it. So, I mean, it was just like there was a there was a huge windfall, I guess, for lack of a better term. Oh, yeah. And in that time frame. Y- you can give it to Uncle Sam and it goes to some program that you personally don't even support. Mm-hmm. Whereas you can buy the machinery and, you know, you, you can use that. So yeah. Yeah. we're certainly all in favor of that. <laughs> right yeah tax purchase yeah yeah and that, but that's that was a big driving factor i mean when i got into this business that was in 2006 the you know the tax purchase thing had not that it hadn't ever been there before but that's when it really kind of started to pick up you know what i mean like you really started to see that turn and and uh right lead times of factories across the yep. board started to grow out you know i mean it was it was you know guys were getting year out you know what or we started doing. I started when I came first came out here, and we were talking about you know 
you ordered a new combine, it might be you ordered it in EOP, so it might you might not get it till uh, the following spring, you know. So skip the whole, you know, the whole time frame, and next thing you know, you're a year out, nine months out, you know, eighteen months out in some cases, you know, where before you got that new combine. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Or, order you know. order it June first. Get it May first. Right. <laughs> but you remember when? when but we... it's funny that you mentioned that when you started, Casey. Because mm-hmm. I started in two thousand. Yep. Corn was literally under two dollars on the board. Everybody sur- was surviving off of LDPs. Haven't heard those initials in years. Beans were like four and a quarter. Mm-hmm. So there was no such thing as end of the year buying for a couple of years in there. There was okay, sweet. We get to we get to exist next year. That was about the the top level of of excitement out of anybody you know unless it was this thing is absolute trash and we have to trade kind of like we've talked a lot here the last couple of years it was really bad then mm-hmm. and then about the time you know about when you started in the yellow i left the red and the last couple of years there, you started seeing a little more and a little more. And we had, you know, quite honestly, from, from 2000 to 13, well, 12 for sure, we had 12 years of tick, 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 nice, steady, yeah, nice, steady growth. growth. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, steady growth. And then in 12, everything went batshit crazy. So it naturally pretty much had to reset itself. Right. Yeah. The, the other comment I was going to make on that, when I first, in 2009, in 2010, our uh, our combine problem was one-year-old 9770s. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, we had like, we had, I don't know how many of them we had, 35 or 40 had, or whatever it was. I don't remember the number, but it was a, it was a fair what amount. What did you say? 35 or 40. No. Of each no, year, no, no. Now I'm talking like each year segment. Like we had, we had oh, several. Yeah. Like we we had over. That's what gave me a job. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. We right. had over yeah. 100 yeah. 9770s. Yep. <clears throat> and but there again, we had the same issue. The issue that we had was we had all of the same. Everything had about the same hours on it. Had about 500 or less separator hours on it. Well, think about it. We had far less stores. Yeah. And sold way more new combines. Yeah, yeah. We sold a hundred combines a year with half the stores we have now. Yeah. Well, I, I can only imagine what it'd been like if we'd have been the same size then. I mean, we probably would have sold two hundred and some odd new combines. I mean, it was just it would have been. We'd still be getting brand new twelves in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm no kidding. But it the same. We had the same issue then that we have now. I mean, it, it's really not different. I mean, the, the only difference is that we were on the higher end, higher side of the spectrum where every combine we had was, you know, a 200 and whatever it was at the time, $250,000 new combine or used combine. Um, and we had, you know, 100 of them. Cause I, yeah, I do remember that. Because our, our, uh, our, uh, we had $25 million in, in combine inventory at the time. I never forget yep. that. Yep. And, so that was, you know, we had that issue there, but we have the same issue now. The only difference is, is we've got a big slug of combines that are, you know, hundred thousand dollar to, to, uh, you know, fifty thousand dollar combines, and we can't find buyers for those per se, right? We can't. Same deal on the other side is like we didn't have enough of a mix. I remember how we were trying to trade those out? We're like we'll trade you this whatever for your, you know. 750 separator hour, whatever. 97, oh, yeah, 60, trying to trade you know, 97s whatever. for yeah. 98s yeah. and 96s. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, still at the time, you could, you know, we were trading, trying to find 9,600 and 9,610 combines that we could sell for 50 grand, you know, and, and 90, you know, 50 series, 60 series that we could sell for, you know, 75 to 100,000, you know, and, and right. you know, those kind of things, you know, trying to find those kind of deals to take, to take their place and, and, that whole how that whole thing flipped and, and grew, and we, as we got through that deal, you know, it came, you know, here comes the next deal, and you know, we had, we had a pretty good 
had a four or five year run there where we had a good mix going at the time. We had plenty of moving used and, and, and buying new and and everything was kind of working the way it should and we had a pretty good harmonious thing going there and, and then, you know, a, a new a new challenge presents itself and you gotta, you know, go out and redirect and recalibrate and, and try to, you know, how are you gonna overcome this problem and what's that look like? So that's right. the one thing about this business I, I, I will I will say that about the time you think you got everything figured out, you get smacked in the face again. Because there's there's yep. never a never a dull moment. You never have anything figured out, ever. Right. I mean, you might think you do, but I can promise that you don't. Because whatever you think you have figured out, that was that was so 1980. You know what I mean? Now you're right. Now you're now you're exactly. moving, you know 2001 called and they want their they want their old tactics back. Right. So, exactly. You know, and that's kind of where that's where we're at now. I mean, we got to go back and reinvent the wheel every every six months. You got to yep. go back and read because nothing stays the same. It's every every time that we sit down and do, and it's the same way on on the producer side. I mean, everything nothing stays the same. They might have some similar planning practices, or you know, however they however they're they're growing their crop. I mean, I'm sure there's some pretty similar things out there, but you know, if something changes every year in the in the operation, and it's the same with us. Oh yeah, I mean, and nothing. and that's all ag is. Whether right. you are. Whether you have five chickens in your backyard or you are a 50,000-acre farmer in Illinois, right? it is constantly adapt and change, adapt and change. Yep. And, to... and it's stuff that you have no control over. Right. Yep. You know, we don't because we have no control over it because us moving machinery depends on the commodity prices and if they're going to have any money so oh yeah <laughs> yeah there's just, never a dull moment and i just love the shit out of it yeah me too there's a uh i always tell my wife you know there's there, we have such a, a finite customer base because there's a reason why you know there's not a, a, a implement dealer in, in downtown chicago selling combines because who's going to buy it right so it's right you know, the farmer is uh Farmer and rancher are the two. That's our that's our customer base, right? We have no yep. no one else is buying a combine. Nobody else is buying a loader tractor. Nobody else is buying a four wheel drive or a planter or this that or other thing. So we have to be able to adapt to what's going on for them and, and try to make it work as much as we possibly can for for everybody involved. Right? right. It's not. Yep. I mean, it's a it's such a a very uh, close um, ecosystem that that. Uh, that we live in there's no you can't take one thing out and and think that it's going to change anything i mean it, it it's going to change it a bunch and, it, and so um just like we saw with planters in 2014 i mean we were trading for whatever it was seven bucks an acre or something like that and then you know the next year we we're like uh we're gonna need 25 bucks an acre to trade <laughs> right <clears throat> you know i mean it was and it was when knowing full well that when we went sound and talked to that producer they weren't gonna there's no way they could do that right um but we had to figure that out and work our way through it and make things happen and, and do what we could do and and that's just the dance we do um where's the market at what what's use what's the what trend cycle are we in right now with uh with with used volume and um what machines are moving fast and what aren't and we have to adjust accordingly uh throughout the throughout the year and and then you know try to guess what next year is going to be like before we even know you know not exactly probably, not a lot of people went hey, you know what i think we're going to see a, a pandemic roll through so we're going to go ahead and adjust accordingly <laughs> yeah. for that now and, and, and there's stuff like that that pops up but no or a drought or you know kind of you can kind of see some forecasts on those kind of things but all kinds of stuff whether it's you know when I was back in Kansas, sure, can aphids were a big deal, and and nobody really thought about that. And all, all of a sudden, lo and behold, not only do you have to spray those things a bunch, if you don't spray them, it gums up your machine, and now you have an, another added expense on top of that. So I mean, there's all these different things that just go into play constantly, and it's just there's just uh, the flow of of the way things work. We have to adjust to that, and. <clears throat> Sometimes you don't know if you're right on what you've adjusted to for 
nine months to a year and then you realize either you're really really right or you're really really wrong and rarely is there any in between yep so exactly <coughs> well that did get us way off topic you weren't kidding <laughs> <laughs> but but it shed huh. a lot of light on a lot of areas and that that yep. was that was the whole point yeah that no, was good stuff that was good stuff well, we have been uh, trudging along here for about 45 minutes. Any last thoughts you want to throw out there before we shut this thing down? Man, not that I can think of. Cool. I, I typically never do, so. That's, and sometimes that's a good thing, you know, so. It, it probably is. The, the, le- the, the, the least amount I can talk is probably the most beneficial. There is some, some wisdom in those statement, no doubt about it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, if folks want to reach out to you, Aaron, and, and kind of pick your brain about what's going on, or just uh, get, catch up on some of these deals you got floating out there on the on the Twitter. What's the best way to do it? Well, I, as you said, I'm pretty active on the Twitterverse. I am at Aaron A A R O N Fintel F is in Frank I N T is in Tom E L. And then uh, call me or text me anytime three zero eight seven six zero eleven ninety three. Right on. And uh, you can check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you're going to find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast. Every once in a while, I write a blog, and I'll put one out there. But um, also check out movingironllc.com. You can find all the latest information about the Moving Iron Summit coming up in Nashville, Tennessee. If you're a dealer and you want to attend that, man, uh, it's a great place to come network and and also get some great information about what's going on in all parts of uh, North American marketplace. So, Hey, and remind everybody <clears throat> what's that? what is new about the summit this year. Oh, yeah. Everybody can come. All colors. Everybody. Yep. Yep. So check it out. This will be, it'll be a great place to, to network. I got a lot of people signed up. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be, I'm looking forward to it. I think we're going to have a, have a good turnout and it's going to be, uh, I think maybe some, some good, uh, good opportunity to get a dust off the uh i've been i've been locked up in my house for a long time uh give everybody a chance to go out and have a little fun and learn about uh what's going on in the uh, in the marketplace so <clears throat> looking forward to it um, and, Na- and nashville in january has got to be a hell of a lot better than us northerners yeah i imagine it by it could be a little warmer than than where it is january in the panhandle i think it's going to be uh a breath of fresh air or you know what it could be a freaking what do they call those things polar vortex could come through yeah and it could be like 14 like uh what's that show uh day after tomorrow when that storm comes right. through freezes everything yeah it's great yep good times looking forward to it for more information about that make sure you check out uh sean hackett he'll give you all kinds of good information about the uh what 21 and 22 are going to look like as far as weather goes and me and him are going to do a podcast as well about that and uh, in more depth, you'll see him at the Moving Iron Summit as well, and he'll have some great information about what's going, what he sees happening. And as much as I hate to say it, not because I don't like Sean. Sean's a great guy, but what he's said so far, as far as forecasts goes, have all have all come true since he's been on the Moving Iron podcast. So make sure you check him out too every Thursday when I post that. So I'll go from there. Check out the Global Ag Network and the great podcasters there. Uh, check out uh, Landon. And Brent over there at the Moving Iron, or at Moving Iron, over right there at the uh, Dryland Farmer Podcast, make you laugh. They guys, uh, guys have some good stuff on there. So, with that, I am Casey Seymour with Aaron Fennell. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the twenty-first century. Hardworking people working hard for. You'll find us here